Hello again, welcome to another episode of the Iranian Market Minute. Today is Tuesday, September 13th, and this is episode number 181. My name is Justin Hewn. I am your host. I'm the founder and publisher of the Uranium Insider Pro newsletter, the only investing newsletter that focuses solely on uranium, finds the best risk-reward investment opportunities in the space, and publishes on a regular monthly basis. As always, nothing that you see or hear in this podcast is intended to be investing advice. I'm not your financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Please always do your own due diligence when it comes to investing and always take responsibility for your own choices. All right. Good to be back with you guys again today with a sincerely risk off day across markets with a higher than expected CPI number coming in today. We had a big, ugly red day across pretty much all markets, although the uranium sector definitely is showing some renewed strength over the last number of weeks. And today it really highlighted that actually finishing, generally speaking, less in the red than the S&P. Now, if you go back a few months, a, a three, four, I think the S&P was down almost 5%, over 4% on the day. That would have been a bloodbath. That would have been 9, 10, 11, 12% down, if not more for some of the uranium equities in the sector. That that really big drawdown in late April uh, we had, you know, massive, massive drawdowns across the uranium sector. And now we're actually continuing to outperform the broad market. That's a really strong sign. Very happy to see that. We'll go over the charts in just a moment. Before we do, um, look, if you are a Uranium Insider Pro member, you should have received an email today, a bulletin email, giving you the date and time of our next members webinar. That is next Monday, uh, the 19th. So look out for that email with those details and that will share with you our guest that we are having. We're very, very excited for this guest. I've mentioned this a number of times. This person is uh, a, a main player within the uh, nuclear and uranium industry. And they're just back from WNA. So we have really fantastic questions and a deep dive interview happening with them. That is for members only. That is coming next Monday. So a week from yesterday. Really look forward to seeing you there. Um, and before we get into today's episode, let's jump right into the uh, daily scoreboard here. Spot price of uranium down about 50 cents, 51.25 a pound mid market. Still kind of quiet uh, in the world of the spot market. Yesterday, spot purchased no additional pounds, nor do they issue any new units. Therefore, they took in no new money. Discount widened at the end of trading yesterday uh, to about minus 2% uh, in their discount to their net asset value. Today, the trust traded down further. We're probably sitting right around a 5 to 6% discount again with markets going risk off today pretty heavily, sitting on 17.1 million in cash. Probably not going to utilize any of that cash to purchase, but you know what? I've said that before and they went out and purchased some more. Can't really buy a whole lot with 17 million considering GNA expenses. So um, they're probably going to wait till they raise uh, raise some more money before going back into the spot market. Yesterday, URA's outstanding shares increased by another 520,000 shares. URNM reported no change. That was 8.7 million in mandated buying from URA's Issuance. All right. Why don't we take a look at the charts and check out today's action? URA down three and a half percent on the day. As I mentioned, pretty significant outperformance of a very, very weak broad market. The SP down 4.3%. The NASDAQ absolutely crushed down five and a half percent. So getting back to URA, why don't we jump ahead and look at URA relative to the SP? This is a chart I like to follow very much. We actually outperformed that. Uh, bloodied broad market today. Very, very pleased to see that. Continue to consolidate in a range for about a week and a half, uh, looking like we're trying to print some type of flag here, whether that's a uh, uh, a bit of a bull pennant that we're working on here, or if we trade down, consolidate and move down, we might be printing a bit of a bull flag. I would honestly like to see this um, relax for a minute, consolidate, rest, pull back slightly, let the 20-day catch up to it. That would be very healthy for the sector. And honestly, the risk off the day came with good timing after an, a run that we've seen over the past number of weeks with a lot of stocks in the space up 30 40 50% since July. It's been a very, very nice move for the sector. And of course, you have to position in these things before these things run because then you have moments like we did a couple of weeks ago where it just absolutely takes off. URNM relative to the spot price sold off today. The spot price moving down slightly. The equity is moving down a bit more than the spot price. We, again, we have this big gap down here. I've highlighted that gap on a number of charts. We've got a big gap on URA. Will we fill it? Remains to be seen. Uh, it certainly is possible. 
I think if we see a retest of, let's say, the 20 days seems almost guaranteed. I think a retest of the 50 day would be healthy. If we retest this rising lower trend line within this very, very long term accumulation cylinder, that also would show some support. Um, obviously, markets are looking short term bearish here. And uh, considering that the spot price is still waiting to really take off, and I do think that still is coming, we could see a bit more of a pullback here. But I am very, very impressed with the strength in the sector today. Cameco actually closed, uh, didn't close in the green, but traded up and was green on the day when we had the S&P down about two and a half or three percent at the time. Still, it looks like we did move down out of this rising wedge, as I did expect. Decent volume today. The dip buyers are definitely out. The dip buyers are out. Uh, Sprott Physical Uranium Trust trading down almost 4% on the day. So now we're actually probably closer to 5.5% discount to NAV. It uh, looks like we definitely have room um, for a bit of support here coming up from the number of moving averages. And then we have major support way, way down here. Do we retest that? I kind of don't think so, but I do expect we could see this discount to NAV widen a bit as we spent this entire time, essentially, um, this whole consolidation period, uh, June, July into August at, you know, at least five and up to 15 plus percent discount to their net asset value. So now sitting here at five and a half, we could certainly sit on a flat spot market for another week and have the trade, have the trust trade down to, you know, getting back to that 10% discount to nav area. In my opinion, if that does happen, that is a screaming buy for anybody who wants to be long the commodity. Um, and also, again, this rising wedge uh, bearish pattern playing out on this rot physical uranium trust. All right, I want to highlight a couple of developments here that, that came through yesterday. This first one coming from the IAEA. This is the International Atomic uh, Energy Agency. This is a quote verbatim. Reflecting the increased interest in nuclear power across the world, the IAEA has revised upwards by 10% its latest high case forecast for the capacity growth in nuclear power generation up to the year 2050. This forecast sees capacity more than doubling to 873 gigawatts electric by 2050. A number of challenges would need to be addressed to achieve this increase, including regulatory and industrial harmonization and progress in high-level waste disposal. This is a significant jump, a 10% jump when we're looking at about a 26, 20, uh, let's see, 27, 28 year um, forecast from the IAEA. So they are seeing nuclear nuclear generation capacity globally double in the next 27 years. That's significant. Now, you might think, uh, okay, 2050, that's so far out. Does that even move the needle right now? Well, you know what? Certainly seeing support coming from multiple governments and seeing these numbers coming from such an official agency, this definitely uh, affects sentiment, at least in the short term. And obviously, keeping an eye on actual reactor builds will, will give you a better idea of the demand towards the end of the decade. And we are sitting currently on, I believe it's 54, 55 reactors currently under construction. Okay, another piece of news I wanted to talk about. Today, uh, Askar Badarbaev from Kazatomprom was interviewed from the guys from Oceanwall. And this was a, this was a great interview. Um, I really like Askar. I have always liked Askar. I think he does a fantastic job. I think he's in a difficult position, um, uh, you know, taking part in the management of this company that is partially public, partially state-owned, majority state-owned, I should say. And, you know, the country is sitting in a very precarious geopolitical uh, position, I should say. So Askar, um, he did a fine job in this interview, and I think he was asked some difficult questions and he navigated them as best as possible. But one, uh, here's a couple of quotes from Askar that I thought were really interesting. And so he was commenting on ANU Energy, which is the physical trust that was set up in Kazakhstan that Kazatom Prom partially initially funded. So they raised, gosh, I believe they raised 50 million, if I recall correctly. And uh, maybe it's more than that, 50 or 75 million. I apologize, I can't remember exactly. But uh, Kazatom Prom put in almost half the money for that initial raise. And there's a follow on raise for expected to do 500 million in an additional raise believe in Q1 of next year. And so Askar was talking about this in the context of the spot market and how thin the spot market is. And his comment essentially was that the spot market is even small for one sprot. So, you know, I don't know if he meant to, if he meant to refer to ANU as another sprot coming on, I don't know exactly how ANU is going to be set up. I don't believe they're going to have an ETM issuing shares into the market at a premium to nav. 
but um, I thought that was a really interesting comment. So, and that's, that really is, you have to put that into context that everybody who's, who's putting out and doing their own supply and demand modeling for the sector, trying to really get a grip on what demand is going to look like, what supply is going to look like going out into the future, therefore formulating, you know, uh, support for an investment case. You can't really model the physical, the physical trusts, right? You, you have to go from, uh, supply and demand based on actual structural mind supply and actual demand from the operating reactors. Now, when you go out into the future, uh, you can you can model out expected life extensions. You can model out uh, expected decommissionings, new construction starts, etc. You can expect you can model out mines coming online when you think that those are going to come online. The amount of production that's expected from those, and get a rough number going out into the future. This is something that we do, but when it comes to secondary demand from physical trusts, from hedge funds. You know, I am hearing that there are hedge funds that are not SPUT, that are, you know, not trust like SPUT, not funds like Yellowcake, not funds like ANU that um, do own and are buying physical uranium as well. And so the fact that this is something that's essentially unpredictable, you can believe as I do that when risk comes back on significantly into the markets and into this market in particular, that the large scale institutional investors are going to go after spot and that's going to allow them to raise cash and buy more pounds. Therefore, you can expect some level of secondary demand coming from physical trusts, but you can't really responsibly model that out because it's so difficult to predict. And right now we're talking about such an incredible uh, such an incredible deficit in supply relative to demand without modeling out a single pound being purchased by secondary demand, by physical trust, by hedge funds, et cetera. And this is really just the gasoline, the, the potential gasoline on the fire coming from these trusts. And we had a great conversation with uh, John Spagli yesterday. I mentioned that uh, yesterday, in yesterday's market minute as well. And um, I don't want to quote him verbatim, but he definitely is, um, let's say positive on the outlook for the sector going forward. And that's putting it really, really lightly. And maybe that's not even a worthwhile thing to share, but um, I wish I could share what he said directly, but I'm not going to out of respect for that private conversation, but let's just say that he's, he's confident in the vehicle that he's built and he's confident in the market going forward. And he sees plenty of interest out there. And like I mentioned yesterday, there, there's a lot of large money sitting on the sidelines, just waiting for volume, waiting for sufficient liquidity. Um, one last note I want to I want to mention. Actually, you know what? There's one more quote from Askar from the from the Kazadan Prime interview. He was discussing. Um, he was asked a question by one of the guys from Ocean Wall. Essentially, you know, what are we missing? Why aren't you guys more bullish? And he basically said, "Well, I am bullish." Um, and he smiled. And then he followed on by essentially saying that those utilities in sleeping mode are going to have a lot of challenges. So basically. He stated that essentially what's happening right now and what is going to continue to happen is that the utilities that are motivated, that they can see the writing on the wall, they know where this market's going, they have uncovered needs going out into the future, they're moving now and they're talking with Kazan and Prom, they're talking with Cameco, they're talking with other primary producing companies or companies that are expected to produce from care and maintenance mines or from greenfield projects. And they're signing those contracts now and they're accumulating, let's say, the, the cheaper future pounds coming from the entities I just mentioned. When you get out into the cost curve, when you're talking about projects with pounds a little bit more in the midterm, um, in the mid tier of, of cost in terms of all in sustaining cost to actually produce uranium, the utilities that are slowly waking up, those are the guys that are going to be buying that. Then you get to the utilities that are like, like Ascar put it in sleeping mode. Um, anybody that's waiting too long to secure their pounds is going to end up being the buyer on the margin. And the buyer on the margin is the buyer that actually pushes price significantly because then you get out to the marginal cost uh, of production projects. You get out to uh, some of the development projects in Namibia because of the grades, you know, there's higher costs um, getting th those pounds into production. You have greenfield projects that need to sign contracts significantly higher than the existing price just to consider, uh, even consider developing their mines. Um, and then of course, you know, what, what if SPUT is the marginal buyer? And they very, very well could be. Um, so if you have long-term uh, uranium contracts really soaking, in a lot, uh, soaking up a lot of future supply and you have utilities, God forbid, actually have to go to the spot market and compete with SPUT, that's when we could really see some fireworks. So I thought that was a really interesting comment from him um, and, and he put in a very, 
very humble and eloquent way as well. The last thing I want to mention here is a tweet from Art Hyde from Segra Capital. And he retweeted a post from Department of Energy, or actually highlighted an article from the from the DOE, energy.gov. Okay, so this is an official article coming from the Department of Energy. And he quotes this, hundreds of retiring coal plant sites could convert to nuclear. You actually have the Department of Energy for the federal government of the United States counting out not only the already retired, but the soon to retire coal plants in the United States and basically suggesting that most of these are ripe for replacement with advanced nuclear projects. And this is the government doing this. This is not the actual companies trying to figure out how to make this happen and petitioning the government to take action. The government is actually saying, hey, this makes sense. And we're actually going out and doing a calculation of the potential former coal sites that could be utilized for SMRs. I I mean, this is stuff of this. This is like every uranium investor's wet dream from 2018. You never, ever, ever would have expected to see something like this. I can't even tell you how gobsmacked I am by reading this. I'm going to go ahead and link to this, uh, to this tweet from uh, Art, or actually just read link to the article below um, in the description, in the show notes below, because I think you definitely should check it out. This stuff is wild. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to happen. It doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. But also, um, you know, giving credit to Art and the guys from Segra and Adam, uh, the article they wrote more more recently about SMRs, um, you say you want a revolution. It's fantastic. I, and I've linked to this many times. I'll link to it again. And uh, you really should read it if you haven't already, because what they highlight is, yes, SMRs are a ways out. Even if we have, we see, you know, the later part of the decade, we're talking five, six, seven years um, plus until perhaps we really see the snowball um, gathering momentum from SMRs. But really, his uh, one of his points is that that demand, that demand is sooner than you think. We're talking about uh, high assay, low enriched uranium for most of these designs. This is a, a much higher enriched product, which requires more feedstock on the front end. And the fact that some of these SMRs do not uh, go through fuel changes. For many, many years, the initial core loads for these things are sometimes significantly higher than their uh, their lower enriched uranium large-scale reactor counterparts on a relative basis. And I think that that's worth considering that this SMR situation is really, really something that that could move the needle in a way that nobody is expecting right now. Just because it's it's projected out you know, multiple years down the road does not mean it doesn't matter for right now and for this trade. So I'm going to link to a number of things. Uh, definitely check them out in the show notes in the description below. Okay, that's enough rambling for me. I will see you again tomorrow. Thank you for watching. I appreciate all of you. Take care. Cheers.